Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Saurabh Agarwal from London, United Kingdom. Dr. Agarwal is an orthopedic surgeon based in London, UK, specializing in upper limb surgery. He moved to London in 2004, where he completed his orthopedic surgical training, then passed his FRC Zorth and the EBOT. He's triple fellowship trained hands, elbow, and trauma, as well as shoulder. He's been actively involved in academics and has run his own FRCS teaching course since 2012. He's very active in research and has done presentations at the international, national, and regional level. Mm -hmm. Currently, he's working as consultant trauma orthopedic and upper limb surgeon at the Princess Royal University Hospital. If you notice, Dr. Agarwal has delivered several lectures on the channel. It's already reached a huge audience, and today's my great honor to bring back Dr. Saurabh Agarwal for this mm -hmm. wonderful live program. Over to you, Saurabh. Yeah, okay. Uh, so thank you, uh, Hitesh, for your uh, kind introduction. It's always a... Uh, uh, a happy feeling to be on your uh, platform as always. So yes, I'm Saurabh. I work at Princess Royal at London. I'm a consultant shoulder, elbow and hand surgeon. So my topic today is Von Jackson syndrome in a rheumatoid hand and wrist. And in a different lecture, which is to follow this one, I'll do an overview on rheumatoid hand and wrist. So basically I've divided it into two. So, uh, so in this lecture, Basically, I'm going to talk about a case, an operative case, where there were tendon ruptures of Von Jackson syndrome and my thought process, how I dealt with it. So rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic disorder, a disease, autoimmune, and it has a genetic predisposition. Pathophysiology, uh, antigen-antibody complexes, we know that. They go and attack synovium, the synovial proliferation, uh, I, there's a panis formation, which then results in lots of enzymes coming and attacking the lo local tissue. So collagenases, the proteases, the elastases, they're going to attack the cartilage, ligaments, uh, synovium, everything around the joint. And no surprises, eventually once the cartilage erodes and ligaments gets damaged, there'll be a subluxation to the joint or joint destruction and ultimately a deformity. And then of course, a uh, tendon is also covered by synovium, as we all know. So they're going to be, or they can be tenosynovitis, uh, which can then result in a, a rupture to the tendons. Now, so causes of dropped fingers. So this is the case I'm referring to. This was a patient referred to me by another hospital. This is how we came in with. He was not able to actively extend his little or ring finger. So dropped fingers. So what are the differentials? First, of course, is an extensor tendon rupture, which is our topic today, i.e. von Jackson syndrome. Or this can also happen because of synovitis in the MCP joints. With the result, uh, the extensor hood gets damaged and uh, uh, sort of the tendons, the extensor tendons drift ulnarwards. Then, of course, uh, MCP subluxations, they go volar and ulnarwards. With the results, fingers will drop. Then on the palmer side, volar plate contractures can happen. Intrinsic muscle contractures can happen, uh, which can all result in drop fingers. And then last but not the least, posterior interosseous nerve palsy, which commonly happens because of radiocapitular synovitis. So we need to know all of them, all these differentials, and how we differentiate. For example, if there's ulna drift, patient will not be able to actively extend, but if I extend his fingers passively, the tendon will centralize and he can keep his fingers extended. For MCP subluxations, uh, no matter what we do, uh, it'll be very hard to get the fingers straight. For volar plate uh, contractures, again, uh, fingers cannot be actively or passively extended. For interosseous nerve palsy, so we know tendons, they have a fixed length. So we can do a tenodesis test. So if I was to uh, flex the wrist, the fingers will extend in a nerve palsy. But in a tendon rupture, even on flexing the wrist, the, tendon, the uh, fingers won't extend. That's how we can differentiate. So coming to our topic today, Von Jackson lesions. These are the things I'm going to talk in the next slide. Cause of Von Jackson lesion. Then the progression of tendon ruptures. Then what is ulna kepert and how it causes a deformity. Then, of course, the treatment of 
tendon damage and damage to the ulnar head so cause and progression so cause is what i pointed with a red arrow so basically uh, ulnar head tends to sublux or dislocate dorsal uh, because of enzymes uh, there is a lot of erosion to the head so there is a mechanical trauma to the extensor tendons and of course there can be a local synovial proliferation which is what happened in my patient and it can also make the tendon weak so two ways so that's the cause and then how in which order does tendon rupture happens so as ulna head will dislocate dorsally the ecu with the subsheath tend to dislocate uh, dislocate volovers so it escapes a rupture edm however can't so it starts with extensor digitorum minimum to the little finger followed by the extensor digitorum communis to the little finger then uh, edc to the ring finger will go and then uh, normally is the uh, epl the reason being epl will get eroded around the lister's tubercle so that's important to know and then occasionally uh, if it's not treated then edc to the middle finger followed by edc and extensor indices proprius to the index finger that's the order of progression ulna caput so if i draw your attention to the uh, to the drawing the line drawing at the bottom right page so this is what happens guys drudge synovitis happens synovial proliferation pannus all this collagenases they will attack collagen so the ligament in the front goes uh, cartilage gets eroded no surprises there that the ulna head tends to go dorsally as it goes dorsally you can see how ecu with this subsheath is tending to come volovers so this is not going to get eroded so it's going to escape the rupture edm how a can't so that's where rupture starts that's the line diagram this is how it look radiologically this is how it's going to look clinically the ulna caput so what are the tendon transfer options we have so let's have a little look so if there was only one rupture edm to the little finger uh so we can take this edm and do a end to side transfer to the intact edc to the ring finger if the two tendons are gone uh so let's say the tendon to the little and the ring finger so in that case we can take the extensor indices from index and we can transfer it to both of them we do a pulvertar free we can do a end to end we can do a side to end depending on the length of tendon and the expertise of the operating surgeon now if three tendons go to the little ring and middle finger then let's see the options so one option is we can take the tendons for little and ring and do a anastom do a pulvertar weave to extensor indices and then the edc to the middle finger we can do a end to side to edc of the index finger or we we could have taken a fds of the ring or the middle finger normally the ring finger bring it out dorsally or from the side radial verge or ulna verge and attach it to the two tendons of the little and ring finger and uh, we can attach the ruptured extensor tendon of the middle finger to the eip we could have even done a end to side anastomosis to the index finger so there are lots of ways we can play around and if if all the four finger extensor tendons are gone which is very rare normally should happen in modern day science and with close follow up to the patients then we can take fds two fds two fds of the ring and the long finger bring it out in this case radial verge or through the interosseous membrane one fds goes to two fingers and two fingers so that's an option so basically the tendons that we have in our arsenal to play around are the extensor indices more often than not the flexor digitorum superficialis to the ring of the long finger and in some cases we can do a end to side anastomosis so remember these three options
uh, and then uh, finally how do we treat the ulna head erosion so few things we can do like i've shown here a uh, drudge hemi but do remember for this to happen your sigmoid knot should be okay but drudge synovitis is seldom but yeah this is an option second thing is the dorsal lip of the sigmoid knot has to be intact if the dorsal lip is not intact this your hemi prosthesis will tend to sublux or dislocate dorsally so always get a ct to see that dorsal lip or we can do a bars procedure which is what i did in my case and i'll show you when i come to the operative pictures or we can even do a direct uh, where we excise the ulna head so now coming to our case our topic today von jackson lesion in a inflammatory arthropathy or rheumatoid arthritis patient so this was a young man as you can see in early 50s this is how he presented to me and then as we were discussing the differentials so make a fist for us when i asked him to Go extend straight. see he can't extend make the fist fingers straight okay make a fist sir make a fist for us so we know that uh these were extensor tendon ruptures other findings of note was this fellow there a big synovial proliferation in the dorsum of the hand and some synovial proliferation going on here so the two lumps on drudge and over the extensor tendon now these were his x rays so i was a bit surprised when i saw the x rays look at the mcps hardly any erosions uh look at the wrist there's no uh, radial deviation there's no ulnar drift or corpus uh but look at the drudge is clearly a grade 4 arthritis <clears throat> on the lateral view again this ulna head to me doesn't it looks a bit big yes the spheroid is a bit hypertrophied if you like there's no marked erosion there are no osteophytes so i felt he was rheumatoid arthritis robustus so in this type of rheumatoid uh the joint is maintained for decades patient is almost asymptomatic in this case there were two reasons i felt for the rupture one was obviously this head was a bit big and if i take you back there was a bit of synovitis going on so head is big i'm sure there may be a little tiny osteophyte which was hard to see so there was a mechanical trauma So equally, if you look at this marked synovial proliferation, there was a local synovial pannus, which caused a local tendon destruction. So it was a combination of both. I felt. So of course he needed surgery, but what is important, especially for young doctors who are taking exam. So these are the key points, which I'm going to discuss in a lot more detail in my next lecture on overview of rheumatoid hand. So assessment is important. MDT approach is important is to tailor your surgeries or non-operative management in relevance to a patient. So, then the any aim of surgery or treatment would be to relieve the pain, restore the function, and improve cosmesis. Now, cosmesis in a rheumatoid patient is very important. It also makes a lot of difference to them psychologically, even if not functionally. establish a relationship with patient because this patient is not going to go away this rheumatoid is not going to go away so he's your patient for next 10 years 15 years so establish a relationship and then in surgical management think of your options because you always have many options in rheumatoid and then of course your results so assessment of a patient so this is what i assess in my sort of practice functional assessment anatomical x rays psychological role of psychotherapist medical management and then finally surgical management functional obviously what they can do and they can't do very important to know that and sometimes you have to talk to your hand therapist talk to your occupational therapist to get a better information anatomical very important to see if there are any lesions how is the skin condition the deform the deformities so very important radiological so if if you compare the two radiographs see the one on the left mcps are maintained there's no radial deviation to the wrist there's no ulna drift to the corpus and look at the drudge is a grade 4 arthritis and look at the ulna styloid is very hypertrophied 
So robustus type uh, patients are normally fine. They, they don't have symptoms. They will have some arthritis error there, but not classical rheumatoid symptoms. So they will not need no medication for decades. That's important to appreciate. Mutilans on the other type is a severe type of rheumatoid where there's a marked destruction, marked uh, destruction of joints, deformities, swellings, so very disabling. Psychological, of course, uh, it's a big sort of uh, psychological trauma to the patients. So very important to involve a psychotherapist, very important to deal with the emotions, their thoughts, their behaviors. So it plays a big role. Medical management, so all these comorbidities are important. You know, heart issues, lung issues, splenomegalies, uh, Stills disease, Jogren's, hence the role of your rheumatology colleague. In fact, they play a more important role, especially in modern day science with all the modern rheumatology drugs. Uh, surgery is becoming less and less. So role of rheumatologist. Their drugs are very important because if you decide to operate, the, and the TNF drugs, they need to be stopped a few weeks before surgery and a few weeks after till your wound heals up. Important to liaise with rheumatologists before you operate to stop these drugs. MDD approach, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of MDD. So your rheumatology friend, your occupational therapist, your hand therapist, and for you as a surgeon. So together, you have to constantly liaise to give the best possible patient care. Then indications for surgery. So of course, if patient is in pain and is not responding to DM, uh, uh, DMARDs or the other painkillers, then you know we need something surgically. If, if he or she is finding difficult uh, to, to, to do his daily chores, his, daily, his or her daily activities, hobby is very important, and the deformity is progressive, then you need to intervene. Aim, of course, will be you want to relieve the pain, you want to give that patient a function, you want to prevent further damage, and cosmesis is important in a rheumatoid patient for their psyche. So let's see what I did for this patient. So we know, remember, there were two drop fingers. So I started with the feeling that I'm going to do a midline approach. I do straight incisions. I don't get contractures or haven't got them. So I don't do curved incisions. And I thought, okay, I'm going to take indices and I'm going to transfer it to these two fingers. So, uh, so what options did I have? Extensor indices, as we discussed. I could have taken FDS from the front or I could have done uh, end to side transfer of the ring to the middle and could have taken indices. So these were the three uh, options which I play with for my uh, operative thing. And also look at this huge synovial swelling. And then there's a swelling at the drudge. So remember these two things. So now when I opened it, again now big swellings, big swellings over drudge. Sorry, beg your pardon. And look with the stitch. I've held a ruptured uh, tendon there, one end of the distal end of the tendon there. So clearly in this case, there was no mechanical trauma. Here is the local synovial proliferation panis collagenesis, which has destroyed this tendon. So remember, there is no eroded ulna head here destroying this tendon. So important. And then of course, there is drudge synovitis. So as I've opened this pouch and I've drained all the panels and the fluid, I could see the proximal ruptured end, which I'm pointing with the knife. So now you can see the two ruptured end, at least of one finger tendon. So as I cleared all the synovium, uh, and I'm sorry, it's not very clear, but you can see that's little finger, ring finger, middle finger, that's the middle finger tendon I'm pointing to. So ring and little, two ruptured tendons were lying here. So I removed all the synovial proliferation and I had found my ruptured tendons. So I found my extensor digiti minimis and the digitum extensor digitorum commonus to little finger and EDC to ring finger. But what I had not anticipated was the middle finger, look at the tendon more than twice the uh, weight, very tatty, 
lots of fibrillations going on there. So if I had not intervened for a few weeks, I'm sure this would have gone. So that was the tendon to the middle finger. Now look at what's happening to the tendon to the index finger. So see rupture tendon one, two, there are a few bits and bobs here more, middle finger and look at the index finger. So it was even this was static. So see how the rupture would have progressed from little to the index finger. So now I had to slightly change my decision for tendon transfer in the sense, because he's young, early fifties, he's a manual laborer. This index finger tendon is also tatty, it's not healthy. So I thought if I take off his indices, I'm going to leave him with a disease tendon to, you know, for his pinch with the thumb. So I decided not to take indices in this case. And so, so my decision making was at that stage to take FDS tendon. And because he was young and heavy work needs a lot of use of his hands, I decided to take FDS to the ring and to the middle and to the middle. So you take so so the way I harvest is obviously you take them out with even fully, you see the corresponding tendon, you pull on it. And if the finger flexes at the PIP and DIP supple, you know, that's the FDS to that corresponding finger finger. So I harvested two FDS tendons and then proximal to the drudge through the interosseous membrane, I make a window and I brought them dorsally. These are my two FDS tendons and these are the ruptured extensor tendons. And then what I've done is one of the FDS I have attached uh, or transferred to the little finger but to the three tendons of the little finger. So two EDMs and one EDC. And what I've done is uh, a wrap around technique and lots of stitches because it couldn't take a pulvita off me. And then you can see that other FD is coming right there. And then I did a pulvert off weave to the EDC of the ring finger, but also because FDS is a strong tendon and I use the opportunity to attach in, uh, the EDC to the middle finger as well. Middle finger was intact, remember, it was very tatty. So I thought, okay, let me uh, strengthen his middle finger extension also. And I have left the two tendons to the index finger. The way I adjust tension is when the wrist is flexed to around 30 degrees, my finger should be in full extension. So again, T no DC is effect. So that's how I adjust my tension. So I've done a bulbar top weave, a wrap around, and that's how I adjust my tension. And then, so once I've addressed the extensor tendons, I, then I had to address the uh, drudge. So remember he had grade four arthritis, so I made a nice capsular flap there, which you can see I'm holding with my tooth forceps. Now on table, the ulna head was found to be very large. So I've shaved off the excessive head. And then you can see this wire holding my ulna head to the sigmoid notch. And the last thing to note is a grade four arthritis in the sigmoid notch, which I was even aware of looking at the x-rays. And finally, uh, I have done a bars procedure. So I have put this flap uh, in between the sigmoid notch and the ulna head. So this is how I would do it. So I'm holding the flap and then I'm going to take it down there and attach it to the volar tissues. So once again, that's the flap. I'm going to take it down and I'm going to attach it to the volar tissues. So basically it's a soft tissue interposition arthroplasty so that the two bare bones will not rub on each other. Uh, and then uh, looking at my tendons, so this is the uh, tendon to the little finger. Uh, this is what I've done, tendon and then pulvert off beef. Uh, and I've attached the ring finger and middle finger tendons to the FDS. And then of course there was no extensor retinaculum that had all been eroded by all these enzymes which we've discussed. So I took a pomaris longus graft from the front to reinforce my extensor retinaculum uh, so that my tendons can glide smoothly and so that there's no bow stringing of my tendons. So once I was happy with that, this is how it looked finally. So I use all my pomaris longus. That's my retinaculum. That's my longus. I've reinforced it. These are my tendons, which I have done transfers to. And so uh, this is how he, uh, this is a gentleman. And this is how Good morning, Mr. Sand looked six Welcome months down the road. 
That's all. Yeah. You got a clock. So you can see these are the two fingers in question. That's the midline uh, incision. Now watch it because he does have some inflammatory arthropathy. So he doesn't fully extend even his normal index and middle finger. Uh, but you can see they, they may be five maybe 5 to 10 degrees lag at the ring finger, around 10 degrees at the little finger, but he doesn't even fully extend his index finger. So we had done some transfers to middle, to ring and to little. Oh, sorry. Okay. And this was his functional life. So I would say 5 to 10 degrees lag, but he's only he's six months down the line. So, and I feel hindsight, even this 10 degree lag can be because of two reasons. One, maybe a local adhesion. Or because I've got two FDSs from the interosseous membrane, there may be a bit of staggering or scarring there. And then in terms of my rehabilitation, of course, we're lucky to have excellent hand therapists in London. But of course, I will discuss these cases with my hand therapist pre-op and then post-op. I'll drop an email to them and tell them what I've done. So important will be to control the edema, protective orthotic positioning and split. It's very important to give them some splints for two and a half, three months. Uh, and of course, these splints should be taken off for them to do their exercises three or four times a day. Uh, in terms of exercises, uh, I like to start them early. So before post-op day five, so tendon is weakest between post-op day five and day 10. So either exercises before day five post-op or after day 10 post-op, whichever you decide to do in your practice. So then tendon transfer training, few ways it can be done, static immobilization. So you put them in a plaster or a splint for six weeks. Not good because it, as tendon heals, it throws a lot of scar tissue and creates a lot of adherence and loss of motion and creates extensive lag versus early active motion or a dynamic mobilization. Dynamic, using these dynamic splints. Again, I do not use them personally because I feel patients find them cumbersome, uh, difficult to sort of wear them. So we do early active motion in uh, my practice, which then means they will wear these static splints throughout the day. They'll take them off four to five times a day and they can do active flexion but passive extension. And I start my hand therapy post of two, day, day two, day three, so before day five. And then of course, as the time will advance, their exercises will advance, uh, uh, which our hand therapists will do. Uh, and then functional retraining is not also tendon transfer. So, you know, the flexors have to be now trained to do extension. And then of course, the function of hand has to come back. That's the most important. So I think that almost finishes my lecture. These are some of the references which I found very useful. This is my website. And then when you go on just on the menu bar or above, you click on the YouTube channel and all these lectures uh, will come up. Those of you have, sort of have time can have a look if you want to. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, uh, any questions, please? Thank you. Thank you, sir, for yet another brilliant presentation. Uh, sir, a few questions. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Hitesh. Yeah. Uh, sir, I remember having read about something called as a horn sign. Okay. The index and the little finger are extended. And you can see that in, uh, is it seen in rheumatoid hand or uh, where you have an extensor digiti communis rupture? Correct. So basically, uh, so it's like a bunny rabbit sign. Do you want to stop sharing? Yeah, I think I'll just. Okay, fine. So can you see me, uh, Hitesh now? Okay, Hitesh, yeah. So it's like a bunny rabbit sign. So what happens is, uh, uh, so when I do this and if I'm able to extend my fingers, that is happening because my uh, uh, extensor indices and my extensor digital minimi are intact. So this is a sign to see if these two are intact. Yes, of course, if I'm planning, so in a rheumatoid, my indices and my digital minimi will go. So this finger will not extend. So if I do this, 
and patient is able to do this. So I know straight away that this is because of indices. So I know I have that tendon which is expendable and I can use it for my tendon transfer. So that's where the sign helps. And Saurabh, uh, a very common scenario for our postgraduates is how do you differentiate between a nerve palsy, like the pin palsy and a tendon rupture? I think you've mentioned, but can you just uh, explain it once more to the, for the benefit of uh, postgraduates? Sure. So in any nerve palsy, the tendon, tendon is there. The length is there. There's no rupture. So the tenodesis effect works on the principle of a fixed length of a tendon. Length is fixed. So for example, my tendons are intact. So if I was to flex my wrist, my fingers will automatically extend at the MCP because now my tendons, extensive tendons have to travel a longer distance. But if I was to extend my wrist, my fingers will flex at MCP because now tendon is taking a shorter route at wrist. So they can have a longer route at MCP. So that's tenodesis effect. So in a nerve palsy, because tendon length is there, if I passively do this, flex the wrist, patient's extensor tendons will extend at the MCP. MCPs will extend. Whereas if the tendon were ruptured here, no matter what I do, whether I flex, and especially when I, so, sorry, whether I extend, or especially when I flex my wrist, because the tendons are ruptured, there's nothing to extend the fingers. So fingers will stay dropped like this. So, so you need to say a tenodesis effect is positive in a nerve palsy, is it? So tenodesis effect uh, will be positive in the in the in the uh, tendon ruptures actually. Tendon in rupture. the sense, uh, I'm doing tenodesis and it's not working. So in a in a in a ruptured tendon, my fingers will stay dropped in a flex wrist. So tenodesis becomes a positive in a tendon rupture. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, Saurabh. Uh, and Saurabh, uh, another very common uh, tendon that is ruptured is the extensor pollicis longus, right? EPL. Yeah. Yeah. And do you see that in rheumatoid? Because if we have discussed the same in uh, distal radius fractures. So do you see the same in rheumatoid as well? Yes, we do. And it's a very frequent tendon to rupture because again, uh, Lister's tubercle, which is where your EPL uh, tends to wind, uh, that's where Lister's will get eroded and there'll be a mechanical trauma as it winds to go to your thumb. So that's my Lister's and tendon is going to the thumb. So it winds around Lister's, uh, eroded Lister's and it gets a mechanical trauma. And then of course, if there is a local tenosynovitis also, there's a local damage also. So it can be a combination of both. But EPL is a very frequent tendon to rupture in rheumatoid. I would say more frequent than your middle finger extensor tendon. Uh, thank you, Saurabh. I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for yet another brilliant presentation and really look forward for one more in the future. Thank you, Hitesh, once again. Uh, lovely to be on your platform. Bye -bye. Thank you very much.